Industrial Security Podcast with Andrew Ginter and Nate Nelson. Sponsored by Waterfall Security Solutions. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Industrial Security Podcast. My name is Nate Nelson. I'm sitting with Andrew Ginter. He's the Vice President of Industrial Security at Waterfall Security Solutions, and he's going to introduce the subject and the guest of today's show. Andrew, how are you? I'm very well. Thank you, Nate. Our guest today is Derek Harp. He is the founder and chairman of CSA. He is also the CEO and founder of Cyberlist. He's an author. He's an educator. And we're going to be talking about basically all of that. Okay, let's listen to you and Derek. So you're involved in a lot of stuff. I mean, the, the, the stuff that I'm most familiar with is the CSE work. I mean, this is a, a worldwide organization that I'm a member of. Can you talk about CSE? What, what is CSE? Yeah, CSE, uh, the, you know, the acronym is, is CS squared AI, and we just, so we call it CSE. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's the Control System Cybersecurity Association International. And it is a, uh, I guess it's a five or six year running experiment that just keeps kind of growing each year and getting bigger. CSE is uh, at its heart, it's essentially drawing together um, cross-functional professionals, so professionals from different parts of, of the same company or different industries or so whether it's suppliers and end users, getting everybody together that cares about securing control-related systems, deterministic engineered systems. Now, that may include medical devices and kind of IoT and industrial IoT things, but things that are quite a bit different the way those networks you know, behave than traditional IT networks. And that's what makes us different than other organizations, cybersecurity organizations that might be out there. We've got engineers and we've got people worrying about public transportation and manufacturing plants and oil refineries with a whole host of different concerns and constraints that really did not have a peer group, a, a person to lean across the table to and say, what are you doing about this? And can I borrow some documentation on this? Or do you have a reference architecture? You know, that those sorts of very primal conversations around what, what what are you doing about it? What do I do about it? What can we do about it together? And if I understand the uh, the CSE, uh organization, the movement um, is tightly coupled to the you know to the meetup concept. Can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. It, it was born out of that actually. Before it was a not for profit you know organization, it was a a series of uh, of meetups. And I just, um, you know, initially for some time, they, they typically met when I was in that town, when I was in that city. Um, some of our more mature locations are those locations, Washington, D.C., and Houston, um, and Atlanta, Georgia, where I live. And then, you know, three or four others that were, after, that were after that. Calgary was an early one. And they were independent, you know, other than, than it was me. And I kind of was setting a tone about, about conversation and about let's not sell anything. You know, even if you have something to sell, which sometimes some years as a serial entrepreneur, I have things to sell. It's like, hey, I'll, I'll lead by example. Let's not sell. Let's build relationships. Let's educate. Let's let's communicate with each other. And and those other byproducts, those things that, you know, obviously we do all care about moving businesses forward. Those will happen, too. But let's not do that primarily. And people have played with those rules. Uh, and then some years later, it became clear that we needed some sort of architecture, the not for profit 501c6 architecture you know, to be able to attract more capital support and do other things. But initially it was independent meetups in different cities. And, you know, a few hundred people would join each individual meetup in, in a matter of, you know, a couple of months. So we knew this was a conversation people wanted to have. Andrew, I don't know what meetups are. Meetups are a, a very general concept. It's not in meetups. It's meetup.com, singular, M-E-E-T-U-P. Dot com. You can go there, you can start a meetup on any topic you want, or you can sort of join a topic that lots of other people are using, but create a local meetup. A meetup is a local organization that meets face-to-face. -face. Now, you know, there's, there's some challenges with face-to-face -face meetings in, in, uh, in the, uh, the world of COVID, um, but, uh, you know, I got connected to CSE through the Calgary Industrial Control System Security meetup. So you go to the website, you fire up a meetup. I mean, people, they fire up meetups on knitting, they fire up meetups on gardening, and they get together and, and you know, talk to each other, build relationships, you know, learn about stuff from each other. Um, and so what, uh, you know, 
historically, what what Derek was saying was um, a handful of meetups had started in different cities, sort of independently. Calgary, Houston, uh, there you know there were a couple of cities that started with this, and he saw this happening, and he said, you know, this is a good idea. We need to encourage this kind of industrial control system security, industrial security meetups, uh, you know, everywhere. And so he started doing that in the meetup space, which is local volunteers organize it, uh, local meetings completely independent of each other. And uh, this is, you know, what became the foundation of CSE, these meetups. And, he, you know, he looked around and said, uh, we need more structure. We need more more pulling of things together. Yes, we need independent local meetings, but we also need a, a global organization. And he started CSE to, as I said, you know, secure funding because he's got sponsors now. He can set up a website. He can recruit more people to the meetup movement. So it's, it you know, it's a thing. And to my point, you know, I, I got started in Calgary. It's independent. And so every meetup is a little different. I mean, my understanding is the Houston meetups are so big that they rent a meeting room. They've got PowerPoints, they've got speakers, they've got, you know, vendors at the door, you know, in off on the little vendor area. In Calgary, they meet in a bar. They reserve a room in a restaurant. They, you know, there's beer. There is a, a usually a, a screen and a PowerPoint because these you can do that in these uh, sort of private rooms in these restaurants. And people get together and talk. So everyone is a little different. It's always about industrial security. So have you been to any of these meetups in Calgary? I have. I've only been to the Calgary meetups. I, I hear about other meetups that, that, you know, other waterfall people are at in, in Houston, especially. Um, but yeah, like I said, in Calgary, you know, you you go to the, the, the restaurant and bar, you get yourself a drink. Often the uh, the vendors will sponsor the, the first round of drinks or, you know, a little bit of food. And then... Uh, like I said, the the uh, the local volunteers come on for five minutes talking about what's happening next, what's happening at CSE, what's happening in the community, and then they've recruited a speaker, usually a vendor, sometimes an end user, talking about industrial security. The speaker goes on for, I don't know, 25 minutes or half an hour, and then we've got sort of another hour of the room, uh, you know, booked, and you you network, you talk to people, you ask them, so, you know. What did you think of the speaker? You ask them, you know, who are you with? What have you been doing lately? What have you learned from that? What can I learn from that? You know, can you talk about what you're doing? Can you talk about what's coming next? Can you talk about why it's coming next? And we just learn from each other sort of very informally. Well, that sounds fun. Um, but now that COVID's sort of keeping us indoors, I imagine that these meetups aren't still happening. That's right. I, you know, can't do face to face, can't rent a room in a restaurant. The restaurants are all closed. You know, the only thing they do is takeout. Um, but let's let's cut back to Derek because I asked him about stuff that CSE is doing, and they're doing a bunch of virtual events, which are sort of a little bit much for local volunteers to put on. But the global organization is uh, is stepping into the gap here. Makes sense to me. I mean, the uh, the Calgary meetup is how I got connected to the the organization, uh, but. You are going further than meetups with CSE. You've got some other projects underway. Um, can you talk about what what's new, what's coming, what haven't we seen yet? Absolutely, yeah. If, if at the core origin story are those getting people together face-to-face, -to -face, um, the amount of people that signed up outstripped our ability, anyone's ability really, to foster that many face-to-face -face interactions. You know, those are continuing to grow. And we certainly believe in getting people together face to face and being able to, to share things and meet up for drinks or coffee a week later. Just, you know, just the person with the person you met, you know, at the event, you're in the same city and you, you're your peers in this industry. Fostering that personal connection is important. If you put that aside, we've had over 17,000 people sign up. So you can't you can't help all those people that way. And so we've started to really work on, especially in the last 24 months, work on what we call virtual things, virtual benefits, virtual interactions. Uh, whatever you want to call them, uh, value propositions for people, no matter where they might be in the world. And we know where 50% of our of our growth is outside the United States, outside North America, for sure. Uh, so how do we help people anywhere they might be? Uh, so one example is we're now, you know, definitely committed to a research function. We're a great, uh, you know, neutral third party to do that or to help facilitate that. Um, and so we are about to release our first research project with a product, which is a uh, an annual report, the 2019 Cybersecurity for Control Systems Report. It is um, the title sponsor of that is KPMG. We had great support from 
uh, many partners. Uh, they happen to be um, the underwriter of this particular research project. Um, and, uh, and we're about to release that. And so the main, the main research tool for that particular project was a long running survey last year that had uh, a really nice participation globally, uh, enough to have, find some interesting statistical, you know, uh, uh, data supported, you know, findings. And, that, and that's what we want this report to be, is to be a decision support tool. And we have a long-term view of being able to do this every year and start to do comparison between years. Uh, we do are beginning to do deeper analysis between different kinds of respondents. Say management level respondents said this and non-management respondents said that about the same kind of question or, or data point. And that's where people can really have some aha moments and say, oh, we have a disconnect or we see things in a different way or different parts of companies see it in different ways or different geographies. The people having to wrestle with this problem halfway around the world fundamentally see something differently than people do, you know, where, wherever you live. So I think we're, we, we, we are really excited to release that product. And then we're already beginning this year's version of that research. And then we're doing additional uh, research tools, not just the primary survey, but other things to fuse other kinds of data into those reports, share some of the, you know, some of the data along the way, not wait just for the annual report, but have more in our news, in our new newsletter. Uh, that we do with Waterfall, uh, one of our, our um, longest term uh, partners uh, for CSA, one of the projects that they help underwrite as a partner. And that's what we call of all of our of our former sponsors. We realize that they're really strategic partners because we do these projects together and we can uh, work on things that benefit members. So anyway, we'll share some of the results of some of the research along the way and leak those things out in tidbits here or there, and then, but then have an annual report every year that is the kind of culmination. So Derek talked about the the research report that's coming based on the survey. Um, you know, I've, I'm one of the the people contributing uh, content and analysis to the report. So you know, there is some there is some really good stuff coming. If people are are interested and they want a preview, I recall that there was a webinar that CSA did. The, the recording of the webinar may still be available on their website. You'd, you'd have to go look. It was about a month and a half ago, giving a sneak preview of some of the preliminary results of the survey without any of the uh, the analysis uh, or comparison you know value add that that's happening now. Um, and you know, speaking of webinars, I think I forgot to ask uh, Derek about the webinar series. But CSA has done, I think, a whole series of webinars last year and is planning to continue that this year. Um, so you know, in this this era of COVID lockdowns and you know, in a, you know, not able to meet face to face in the meetups, um, you know, there are webinars that that uh, CSA is is uh, is putting out. There's also the newsletter. If you you know look, go into the the, the CSA website and sign up for the newsletter, uh, you know you 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 can get some value out of that. You you want to see the webinars that are coming up? They'll be in the newsletter. So um, you know, there's a whole there's a whole suite of stuff that that CSA is doing sort of globally. And again, anything you do globally is going to be virtual because you can't get the whole world together face to face. And I understand that uh, you are planning a podcast. I mean, this is the Industrial Security Podcast. Um, have you got a name for for your venue? What what's coming there? Yeah, well, naming a podcast is tough. Um, so you know, right now it's it's uh, in in the uh, we we've recorded a number of sessions, and we have more recording, uh, more more interviews set up uh, that are coming soon or next next week. Uh, and so it's the CSA, you know, podcast. If it may get some sort of better name. Uh, hopefully, something inspirational will come along. Um, the first series that we're doing of related interviews is what we're calling the security leaders interviews. And so we're interviewing security leaders um, across the world, across diversity of type of company, uh, size of company, geography. Uh, and it's really uh, in support of one of our major areas, workforce development, which is a big, big part of what we're, we're you know, we're about is to interview these folks and find out their journey that led to where they are. The decisions they made, they ended up being, you know, good ones and fortuitous ones, decisions they wish they'd made differently. Um, it's an opportunity for some of these leaders, many of which are big believers in mentorship, both receiving and giving mentorship. It's an opportunity for them to to give some, you know, share some wisdom they've gathered along the way with uh, any of our listeners. And we do know that we have a, you know, a portion of our membership demographic are people that are entering this space from a variety of entry points and asking themselves and asking us the questions of what do I do next? And 
you know, what, what should I do for my career path and how do I get from A to B to up there to some, you know, potentially aspirational position that I can see, but I don't really know how to get there. And we're hoping that these will be interesting interviews. They're very personal, uh, but also very, very informative and that the right listener will hear the right one at the right time and go, oh, that's, that's something I could do. I could take that clue or that little piece that, uh, that helps somebody, you know, in their career path. That would be a really good one for me to use too and, and, and take action. Sounds good. I mean, the uh, the world needs more industrial security, and you know, I welcome uh, another uh, relevant uh, podcast or three, especially the uh, you know the kind of quality that that you know, of of production that that uh, and content really that I look forward to from uh, from you know any enterprise that that has people like you uh, uh, working on it. Oh well, that's that is very um, that's very kind of you to say so. I'm I'm. We're, we're, we're certainly excited about it and we hope we can meet those kinds of expectations, Andrew. Um, it's, we think it's important and it, you know, it, it's, it's one more of these things kind of underlying your question is what are all the things we can do? That one was on the drawing board and really the availability of some extra time due to this unique challenge of COVID-19 that we're in right now, that availability of extra time is what unlocked that. We said, you know what, let's pull a few, few things off the shelf. We do have the time to do it. Uh, the people that we would like to interview also have you know some extra flexibility if if not time and you know let's do that and so maybe that's perhaps a little silver lining in a in a pretty challenging time uh, at least that's my hope and that when we can get these start to release these people will find them valuable and i think we'll do you know we're calling this the security leader series our vision is that we'll do different kinds of podcasts and uh, we'll have different content available for people through that medium you know we certainly already have a lot of virtual um, recordings online. Uh, we do virtual meetings uh, every month, sometimes one, sometimes two. That pace may, may start to really pick up. Uh, and people can go into the library of those and say, you know, okay, I want to listen to one on this particular topic. Um, and we'll, you know, hopefully we'll have, you know, we have quite a few already, but at the rate that we're planning to expand that, that library could be quite a, a content treasure trove for, you know, for just about anybody. So it sounds like Derek's got a uh, a somewhat different approach than we do to industrial security podcasting, but I don't know, Andrew. I I think we might have to take this guy out, crush the competition. Yeah, right. I uh, I disagree. I think there's uh, a lot of opportunity in the space uh, right now. I'm aware of two sort of uh, ongoing podcasts in the industrial security space: ourselves and Dale Peterson's unsolicited response. Uh, but to, to Derek's podcast coming up, he actually interviewed me. He's, he's building up sort of a set of content, and then he's going to start releasing it uh, in the podcast series. He interviewed me, and uh, he didn't ask me so much about what is industrial security and why is it different from IT security. It wasn't really a, a security interview. He wanted to know about my personal experience as a leader in the industrial security space. How did I wind up there? Uh, you know, what did I do before? Uh, do I have any advice for people trying to get into the space? Is the career path that I followed something that, you know, is is something that people want to understand and maybe take advantage of opportunities if they see them coming? So it's a very different take, at least the first series of, of episodes is a very different take on the field than I've seen us do or that I've seen uh, the Unsolicited Response podcast do. A word from our sponsor. Waterfall Security Solutions is the OT security company. Our latest product, Waterfall for Intrusion Detection Systems, enables safe connections between industrial intrusion detection sensors and the industrial networks those sensors monitor. Like all Waterfall products, Waterfall for IDS provides physical protection for important OT and industrial networks, not just software-based protections. For details, please visit the Waterfall website. Thank you for your attention. I also introduced you as the founder and CEO of The Cyber List, where I understand you lead a team of experts who do in-person training. You know, sometimes classroom training, sometimes at, at conferences and, and other settings. You do training on a wide variety of topics. I understand that you personally do some of that training as well. You know, can I ask, how's that going for you? <laughs> well, if you'd asked me um, on March 5th, I would have said really fantastic. Um, it's a bit of a challenging time uh, right now for, you know, for lots of people, but certainly public speakers. Um, 
you know, it goes without saying, public venue uh, opportunities and, and face-to-face opportunities have, have been closed off for now. Um, so, you know, I think I'm trying not to interpret anything as lack of interest in cybersecurity, but rather people are quite distracted. And understandably, right? People are facing uh, decision makers who might say, hey, we want to bring in a speaker or a cyber, you know, educator. It's not that I hope many of them still want to do that and will realize, and I'm doing some writing to support this online right now. It's like, don't forget cybersecurity, especially now. So I think people will get back to it. In the short term, um, there there is less engagement, um, you know, but I think as many of us are pivoting, and I certainly am, to offering virtual opportunities to work with uh, workforces and, and groups. Um, you know, my particular favorite group that I speak to are business owners and senior managers of companies, non-technical people, making cybersecurity kind of accessible for them and giving them actionable things they can do. Um, I think we can deliver a lot of that value still, you know, virtually for however long we have to. You know, I love a good face-to-face opportunity as much as anybody, but I think we can still help people. And I certainly think there's a very important theme right now. Of don't let your don't let your guard down, which is one of my you know one of my blog entries was about that. It's it's you know this theme COVID nineteen is being taken full advantage of by you know by threat actors and by uh, adversaries. So I could almost I would almost suggest now that it's it's you know it's more important than ever to be doing this but people have a lot of prioritization challenges that they have to they have to make every day right now what they're going to do and what they're going to do tomorrow okay so so one one more quick question in that vein um you know we'd all like to know when this covid thing is going to be over um you've got some insight into that in the sense that you can see you know you're involved with a lot of events um you've seen a lot of events canceled um, what's the first physical get together cybersecurity event that you're aware of that has not yet been canceled? How far out has stuff been canceled? Yeah, I um, I've seen quite a bit of cancellation. The only one that I still have on the books, though, the conference organizer did send a notice saying, "Hey, we're still on, but it's you know stay flexible. We're not sure." Is September a, a conference in September, mid September? Um, most everything else between now and, and, and August 19th is going, you know, has gone away. Um, and so I think even if people are, people are questioning say, even if, you know, even if in a shorter t- time frame the restrictions were currently under were lifted and you could be in a face-to-face venue, things have slid from now into some of, maybe into some of those months. And so those months are getting harder to book. So we have, for instance, an event we were working on in, in the fall they don't want to book it even though it's open because they're not sure what's going to slide from now to then. So I think it's becoming a log jam in a way. It's a question. It's a two part question. When will we be able to be face to face again? And then when can people, you know, what will be the aftermath of all these cancellations and things having been moved around? You know, how long into the future will we re- will we be rebooking? things that were, you know, that were originally on the book in, in you know, in the first part of, of 2020. At Waterfall, we do a lot of face-to-face events. So I kind of echo what, uh, what I've heard Derek saying here. Um, the first event I'm aware of that has not yet been canceled, but is likely to be, is uh, the end of August. And, uh, you know, to Derek's point, there's historically a burst of events, uh, sort of very late September, all of October and first half of November. That's sort of prime time for events. Um, But, you know, given the uncertainty around COVID, we may see that entire burst of events canceled as well. You know, it's possible we don't see any face to face events until, you know, first or second quarter of 2021. At this point, we just don't know. Your team at the CyberList has different specializations. Can you give us an example? I, I mean, you personally deliver some of the training. What's your specialty? Personally, I'm focused on what I call cyber behaviors. I'm focused on things that are the decisions, and unfortunately, the very, very poor decisions most of us make in the marketplace um, You know, with connected technology. And so these are things that we could just do differently. And I'm not making that a trivial thing. Human beings change their behaviors it's very challenging for human beings to change their behaviors and say it's difficult. We don't change our behaviors easily. We can, but it, it takes, uh, you know, it takes some uh, thoughtfulness and, and maybe some other uh, mechanisms that people aren't necessarily always deploying to do it. Um, 
And that that's what I'm focused on is like, can I in an hour or hour and a half or two hour workshop in whatever my time slot is, can I affect people to the point where they take in some new knowledge? Sure. But then can they also decide or commit to even a couple of new actions that they're going to take or not take in the case may be. Um, and I feel like that, you know, then that's been valuable for me and for them. That, that, that's my goal. So if your audience is um, people without a lot of cyber background, um, can you give us an example of a takeaway, an educational nugget that that you would leave with one of these audience? What do you tell these folks? Yeah, sure. And I would caveat, I'd say I do do I do do uh, portions, divisions or departments of much, much larger companies as well. So I think the intimacy of the venue, instead of talking, you know, to thousands of people in an entertainment format, that that's not what I tend to do. But if I can have, uh, you know, if I have business leaders or a group of managers or or a whole group, a whole division or department, so it could be a small company it's in, in its entirety, or it could be a management level group at a larger company. Either way, it's stuff that they can take back to their uh, team members and 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 say, hey, let's implement this, or ask very very smart questions they might not have asking asking before. You know, I do focus on some very simple things, and one could say, well, you know, in corporate America, people. <laughs> People already know not to click on, you know, certain kinds of links, don't they? Or open certain kind of attachments. And I will tell you, you know, I have, I run simulations. I do high impact demonstrations and I, I do a variety of things as part of my, you know, my own engagements. And they are designed to, to get people's attention instead of just a dry PowerPoint presentation saying, here are some facts and data. Did you know that 32% of you are vulnerable to this? You know, that's not valuable to people and not how people really take on new information or behavior change. So I try to design things. Uh, that are interactive and that that um, are very confirming of that many of us, and it could be many of us in a room, and I always use the we, even though I'd like to think I'm not doing these things, um, I can prove, you know, out that some of these people, you know, like, look, you, you are clicking on these links, and here are the things you need to be looking for, you and your teams, we, we have to change our, fundamentally change our relationship to connected technology and go from trusting everything to not trusting things, and so this kind of link, let me show you, you know, has clues or this email that's a fit, you know, looks like a phishing email. It is a phishing email. If somebody were to send it to you, you hear all the things you might look for. You've got, you've got to become suspicious. And I'm not a purveyor of, of the old classic fear of certainty and doubt, you know, but even though some things I do, I know generate some fear or anxiety and people share that with me. I say, well, I know that that's true. I don't want to be, you know, that to be the central message. The message is you can take action. There are things you can do. Here's examples of what those things are. Um, you know, and, and we've just got to stop the behavior. You know, a, a simple example is I say, look, it's not perfect. And yes, there's been progress that's been made in, in wireless hotspot technology. At the end of the day, though, just don't get on a coffee shop or an airport or, or anybody's wireless network, especially one that you can't even pin down exactly where it's coming from. Heaven forbid you on that one, but I wouldn't get on anybody's. I tether to my phone and that's the end of that. Um, is that a perfect solution that mitigates all the risks I might be exposed to while I'm traveling? No. But it's it's a mitigator, and that's a lot about how I talk about take risk mitigation, reduce your gross risk from wherever it is now, very very high, to a low. And yes, it may take more money or time or effort or technologies to go even lower. But if you could go, let's say, from eighty percent to twenty percent risk profile with low hanging cheap steps and decisions, you should do that. Don't get hung up on the fact that you're not at zero. You know, nobody's going to arrive at perfect security. So I'm trying to get people to say chip away, a big, take a big chunk out of your risk profile and celebrate that. Work with others to go even further as your case warrants, as the type of company you are warrants that, but go from 80 to 20 as quickly as you possibly can and then strategize about what you need to go and become, you know, to become more safe, to become more secure. Now, rumor has it that you're not just a leader and an educator, but you're also an author. Um, can you can you talk about what's coming? Yeah, <laughs> it's just funny. You and I had a recent chat about this since you are a, an author. You know, I have written um, papers and uh, so my authorship to date has been papers and podcast, uh, uh, blogs and, and articles on LinkedIn, and things like that. And I enjoy it. It's a bit labor intensive for me. I think some people are born with the gift of uh, easily, uh, you know, jotting some stuff down that's brilliant and getting it out. Uh, for me, it's, it's, you know, wanting to be relevant and wanting it to be good is, is a little bit more labor intensive. But I am, uh, I have started the process of, of writing a book on cyber behaviors, kind of what I was talking about earlier. 
um, the things that we as a society need to you know need to change in how we how we act and how we trust connected technology. So that um, working title Cyber Behaviors book is, is something I am working on right now and, and excited to finish at some point. Uh, I, you know I'm finding it it's a it's not a it's not a trivial task to get you know to, to write a book. And I know I'm speaking to the you know the choir. You've done it twice and you know you know what goes into it. Yes, indeed. It's uh, it's much easier to say the words "I am writing a book" than it is to say the words "I have written a book." Yes, yes, absolutely, no doubt about it. Well, we certainly look forward to it uh, when it comes out, and I, I encourage you to uh, to stick to it. Thanks, Andrew. I will. I will. I promise. Andrew, you've written a few books. I've read most of them. Uh, how is it writing books about industrial security or whatnot? So what I found is that, you know, the, the, the tricky bit with writing a book for me is figuring out what not to write because there's, there's an infinite amount of stuff you can write. You can talk about how control systems work. You can talk about how security works. You can talk about how attacks work. You can talk about all of that. And a lot of it's been written already. And so what I find is that it's, it's, uh, it helps enormously if you understand who is your audience and what do they need to know? Um, if you lose track of your audience, I, me personally, if I lose track of my audience, everything freezes, and I eventually throw you know throw the entire effort out. My first book, the Red Book, Skate of Security, What's Broken and How to Fix It, um, I threw it out twice because I lost track of my audience. You know, I thought initially I had an audience in mind, and then I said yes, but these other people need to know this too, and so do these other people, and I expanded the audience, and now you don't know anymore what everyone knows, everyone knows something different, and it just froze. And, you know, my experience in the Red Book was uh, in early, what was it, early 2015, 2016, early 2016, there was an article came out in IEEE Spectrum, which is sort of the high end of technical news. It's not peer-reviewed, it's not research reports, but it's the high end of, of technical. Um, and it was talking about the attack on the Ukraine the previous year, and the conclusion was just horribly wrong. And I, I was so frustrated. I said, what am I going to do, right? You know, write a strongly worded letter to the editor. No one's going to read this. People are going to cite this article for the next decade about this attack. And it's wrong. And, you know, I looked at, at uh, the author. It was a staff author, you know. He didn't know any better. He'd interviewed some people. They told him the wrong things. And, and he wrote it down. And so then and there, I threw out my current copy of the Red Book, and I restarted from scratch saying, my goal is this person. I am writing enough so that if this person read the book I'm producing, they could never in good conscience produce another article that was this wrong. And that was focus. I had one person as a, a focus for the audience, and I wrote the book. And I guess, you know, dumb luck, other people found it useful too. But um, you know, it's enormously important to me, I don't know about, about everyone, but to me to understand who is your audience and, and uh, you know, what do they know already? What do they need to know? Then you, then I can write. And, you know, for the record, I'm a great fan of books. I've bought personally most of the industrial security books on the market, new and old. Uh, so, you know, I do wish Derek well. The, the world needs more books, you know, and more focused. There's lots of bits of the problem that, that need to be focused on. So this has been great, Derek. Uh, thank you very much. We like to leave our guests with the last word. Is there a thought you'd like to leave with our listeners? Yeah, you know, there is. Um, I think I'd like to say if, if you are listening to this and you have exposure to industrial control systems, and most people do, if you think about uh, or look into how that's defined, that may include uh, building control systems like elevator systems and lighting systems and electric systems and HVAC systems. So the the opportunity for most companies is to say yes. You know, certainly obviously a power plant or an oil refinery, that's an easy yes. But but it's true that many of us have exposure to various types of control systems and IoT systems that are, you know, they're that are quickly uh, being embedded in our uh, in our environments. I'd say definitely make sure that you or someone that you charge, if you're, uh, if it's someone's, you know, on your team, is is taking this seriously. Uh, those of us, uh, and, and I'm not one of the original pioneers. I've been lucky to have 
mentors and people on our advisory board at CSA who have been some of the actual pioneers working on, hey, there's going to be a problem with all this connected technology. Um, if, if you if you look at this problem area, uh, if people have felt for a long time they were just alone on the street corner, you know, yelling into the wind on this. It's 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 widely accepted now that there's a bunch of risks and business risks, financial risks, reputational risks. And so I would encourage definitely looking into uh, you know, into this area and making sure that someone in the company is, is charged with it if you, are, if you aren't already doing that. What is our nexus to physical systems, to operating technology systems? You know, what, what things do we need to care about beyond just traditional IT cybersecurity? And uh, for some companies, that's a significant amount of stuff, but I think it surprises many companies, you know, that they, they at least have some exposure to that. So I'd say look into it, do your homework, look into it. CSA is certainly a, a very inexpensive way to educate team members, uh, you know, and, and get uh, access to great content and educational materials around, you know, around this particular issue area. And so I would encourage you to look this up and, and getting involved. All right. And with that, let's, uh, let's wrap things up here. Thanks to Derek Harp for speaking with you, Andrew. And thanks to you, Andrew, for speaking with me. Always a pleasure, Nate. We'll catch you next time. This has been the Industrial Security Podcast from Waterfall. Thanks to everybody who's listening. Mm-hmm.